Will, good morning. How are you, my man? Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Will's from Australia. I am. Where we see sometimes some of these like goofy, not goofy, but th these these morning uh, talk shows. I think we just did one. We played a clip from a television sh uh, station there. They were interviewing a man that has sex with cars, uh -huh. uh, and uh, so we played a clip of that on our show yesterday. Right. But you actually, you did a lot of radio I, 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 in Australia. I, I loved it. I thought you were about to say it, but you've actually had sex with a car, right? <laughs> You're in here live to talk about that. That's why you've come to Cleveland. <laughs> now, you've, you, you've done a lot of radio. Yeah, man. I used to do uh, morning radio in Australia, and uh, I remember, because I grew up on a dairy farm. Like yeah. my, my dad's like a farmer, and I remember leaving the farm because I was like, I, there's no way I'm going to spend the rest of my life getting up at five o'clock in the morning and milk cows yeah and then started doing morning radio where you know you get up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> my dad rang me on the first morning he was just like what are you doing i said i'm going to work he said i said what are you doing he goes going back to bed for another hour <laughs> so. so you you did that for many years like uh, 10 years or something right? yeah or uh, not quite but like yeah a long time yeah yeah uh and and you never get used to waking up that early do man you? like there is a part of it, you you guys will know what i'm talking about but for your listeners there's a part of a man's body that you know some Sometimes gets up a little earlier than yes, you do. Yes. When you do morning radio, even that part of your body's like, <laughs> seriously, dude, five more minutes. <laughs> the only reason you ever get hard at quarter four in the morning is it's trying to reach the snooze button. You know? <laughs> do you do, do you ever like? Every day I wake up, I just want to uh, like call in sick every day, and I've been doing this for more than ten years. I can't. Uh, it's you just, think you'd be used to it by now, and you, you start getting think, up? You would think, never. But, uh, no, I guess. I, I reckon it's the middle of the day that's the hard one. Because get up in the morning, you guys are having a great time in here. You kind of get in here, and your, your audience lifts you up, right? Yeah. But there's this period of time when you get up early for radio, about one o'clock in the afternoon, where I always said that you could be talking to like Nelson Mandela, and you'd be like, "You've done some pretty cool things for the world, man." <laughs> but if I stabbed you to death, right? Right now, I could sleep in your warm corpse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, so you, your dad was a farmer. Uh -huh. You grew up on a farm there. Yeah. So. You must have, uh, did he put you to work? I mean, I don't know how it is over there, but I'm like over here, if you grow up on a farm, you're out there, you're milking the cows, you're doing this, you're doing that. It's tough. It's a tough life. Right. Yes. I mean, so my granddad was a farmer. My dad's a farmer. My brother's a farmer. So I, I just didn't want to do it like because it's a tough life. I used to have to get up and milk cows before school, which yeah. was ridiculous. And uh, I, I just wanted to tell dick jokes to strangers, you know, that was my, but I remember t having to tell my parents, you know, when you, like I sat them down at like 15, it was almost like my coming out, my version of coming out yeah. was telling them I didn't want to be a farmer. Yeah. So I sat them down and it was one of those moments where your parents know you heaps better than you know yourself. Cause I've said to them, look, I, I, I really don't think I can be a farmer. And they've just gone, yep, no, this is good for us too. <laughs> yeah. Your brother can take over. We like how this is a farm, not a meth lab. <laughs> Jog on. <laughs> so... You, uh, what what part of Australia are you from? Was this like a, a tiny uh, little town out in the middle of nowhere, or where are you from? So uh, I grew up on a road called Anderson's Road, which is actually named after my grandfather who built the road. There was about 160 people where oh, I grew wow. up. Wow. The nearest like big town where I went to school, like to like to primary school, was yeah. like 1,200 people. Wow. And then like where I went to like high school was like 12,000 people. That was like so the big time. Plus. Everyone knew everyone's business basically. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In these yeah, little yeah. towns, you know, so like if you wanted to hook up with a chick or something, everyone would know what you were up to, basically. Oh my God, everyone would. Yeah, I mean, at that, most of them were in your own family. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it was hard to find someone outside the gene pool. So then, how did you did you start? So you start with stand up comedy before you do radio and all of that. Stand up is where you got your start. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was I always wanted to be a stand up. Like I started watching uh, like American guys. That's why I've come over here to work because for me it was guys like uh, George Carlin and Richard Pryor and like you know I, I we I, we would find these albums because that's all you could do back in the day like cassette tapes or like actual you know vinyl albums and listen to these things over and over and over again and yeah so I was like that sounds like a good job. What is the comedy scene like in Australia? I mean, is it is it big? Is it? I mean, it's big here in the United States. So uh, I, I always say that we're kind of like a generation behind, yeah. if that makes sense. So yeah. it's kind of getting big now. In the last 20 years, it's really grown. But when I started, it was like, you know, running away to join the circus, you know. Yeah. But these days, like, uh, the thing I love about touring in America is the audience's have seen comedy before they understand how it works like sometimes in australia still when i go out to do a gig people have never seen they've never seen stand-up comedy seen stand -up. before now they, it seems like it's it's a, a i mean a 
the impression i i almost went to australia a couple uh, about a month ago uh, or two months ago and i may go i may go in december i, I didn't want to go the weather you know I, when i was going to go in august i go it's winter time down there now why would i go why would i leave here it's nice weather here and go to australia where it's winter time right. I, I mean i guess winters aren't bad down there no. whatever but but still I, it's not like winter here i came here in december last year and i was just saying to somebody i was like i didn't I, I came to Cleveland yesterday and I'm like, oh, Cleveland's really nice. Like it was under snow the entire time I was here. Yeah. I had no idea what it looked like. Yeah. And then, yeah, you know, all the trees and everything. It's, yeah. It does, it, does it snow anywhere? Maybe in the southern parts of Australia, does it snow down there? It snows like in the mountains where people go to ski. Yeah. But it doesn't like snow. If it snowed in Australia, like in the street, yeah. people would assume it was the end of the world. See, I would, I would, the impression I have of Australia is that it's, it's at least the big cities are, are modern and, progressive and and you would think that when you would do these comedy shows everyone would have would kind of know the routine or are you doing these in like uh in the outback or whatever (laughs) right well we are you know because there is only like uh you know most of australia lives in those big cities and yeah yeah, like i mean the melbourne comedy festival has been going for 30 years so cities like that definitely not but sometimes you'll go like into the outback to do these gigs in these places and you know they've never seen live stand up before so you you do that and then uh you get onto radio after after you've been doing stand up for how long? So I, I was doing stand up for about four years when I got the radio job. Yeah, I guess, and then did that for pretty much. The radio will give anyone a job if you tell them you're a stand up comedian. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're good, bad, whatever. Radio <laughs> just just loves that, and they're like, hire that guy. <laughs> and they work cheap too. That's that's the other reason radio likes. It's like stand up comedians when they're just beginning. They go twenty two thousand dollars a year. <laughs> yes, I'll take it. I'll sign. Yes, right. yes, sign me up. The yes. last two years I've been doing yeah. gigs for free beer. I'll sign <laughs> this is a good opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, did, did that then help your uh, comedy career being on? Because you were on a radio, there's a little bit different. It I mean, we're, we're syndicated here, but we're on in multiple cities, but most morning shows are here are not syndicated they're not all over but there i think it was like all over australia right Right. so some, some will have city to city like there'll be specific city ones but my the show that i did was like a national show it went everywhere in australia you could literally listen to it anywhere in australia and you had no radio experience no and they put you on the morning show yes screw you i worked a long time <laughs> to get this job <laughs> You've got to you've got to come from a smaller country, man. There's only 22 million of us. That's how you get a job. Uh, so you do that. That helps your comedy. I mean, obviously now people know who you are because you're on this uh, national radio show. So it helps you out. And then from there, you end up getting TV gigs. Uh-huh. You did a, some show called The Glass House, I think it was called. That's right. What is that? Is this like a Big Brother style thing? Or no, what is- it was like a. Um, do you remember that uh, show, Politically Incorrect? Yeah, sure, with Bill right. Maher. With yeah. Bill Maher. Yeah. So it was kind of like, a, we played it a bit more for laughs, but it was like a current affairs news, like comedy panel show where ah, okay. people would get on and like talk about the news and debate issues, but like done for funny. Like we were doing it to like make people See, laugh. See, that sounds like a lot of fun. I thought you hosted, I mean, just the glass house. That To me, that sounds like Big Brother and they like build like a glass house and there's cameras in there and people are Watch locked it. in there. And right. who, who's yeah. the last one that doesn't get kicked yeah. out or whatever? Yeah. And they have to throw stones at each other. Yeah. It's a competitive yeah. thing. Yeah. So that actually... Actually, I mean, the way you describe it, it sounds like a, a lot of fun. So how long did you do that? So six years. We did 216 episodes of it. It was weekly. And then did you, did you, uh, did they end the show? Did you leave? Or what well, happened? it got, ca- <laughs> see, no one really knows, but when it got canceled, because it was going very well, but we were very anti the government yeah. and uh, we were on a government like funded network like you know australia has like one government funded network the abc right okay the taxpayers pay for kind of like the bbc is in like you know in britain right right right. or pbs here yeah Yeah. but but no one really watches pbs right so abc is like the third biggest network in australia it's like a really popular thing but it is government funded so we used to make fun of the prime minister quite a lot like those sort of shows do yeah and then like when the show got cancelled everyone assumed that the prime minister had cancelled the show right yeah so the prime minister of australia had to put out a press release to say that he had not cancelled my show. <laughs> and you don't know how weird a day you're having when you lose your job and the Prime Minister of your country puts out a press release <laughs> to say he had nothing to do with Is it. Is that true? Did he have nothing to do with it? Did they just, why, why well, do you think they Well, it's kind of suspicious when he says, I have nothing to yeah. do with it. I'm like, yeah. 
you know, when I when I lost my job delivering pamphlets when I was sixteen, you didn't put out a press release, you know. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like a, we are now skeptical of what the government is telling us here because with all of this Ebola stuff, they oh right. no, we've got it under control, and then we find out that this patient was in the hospital in Dallas mm-hmm. for two days and they weren't wearing the hazmat suits or anything. They were just. You know, now a couple of these nurses have it. One of the nurses was here in town right. uh, over the weekend. So, you know, you wonder sometimes when your government tells you stuff whether you should really... I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, no. but I wonder whether they really do have it under control. I, I feel like it's more a compliment to Cleveland. You know, Cleveland's got its swing back. You know, Le- yeah. LeBron's back. Yes. Ebola wants to be here. <laughs> like, you know, everyone wants to be in Cleveland. It's the center of the news. That's, That's right, what I yeah. think. Someone sent me a text message earlier. They go, hey, just finally when we get, like, a, a winning teams, LeBron James right. comes back. Now Ebola, of course, just right. our luck. We're known for having horrible luck here. That, that would be the worst story but preseason. <laughs> like, LeBron's back, but Kevin Love has... As a bowler. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you uh, you still live in Australia now, or, uh, or do you live here? Half and half. So I'm based in uh, in LA while while I'm over here. So I've been like touring around for about seven months here this year. But I go back and forth. So you you not only worked on this show, the the Glass House, but then you had uh, some other show, which I have no idea how right. you even pronounced the title. It was called the the Gruen Transfer or something. Is you, that how you pronounce it? You have nailed that, by the way. Uh, and and this is strange. Apparently in Australia, like we're we're simpletons here. Like we just have like the names of our shows right. wipeout. You know what it is? <laughs> it's like people getting smashed with things and falling into water. Yeah, sixty there, minutes. It goes for sixty minutes. Yeah. That's all we want. There, uh, who who knows? <laughs> with the glass house, I thought it's a reality show. Nope, nope. It's like uh, Bill Maher's uh, politically politically incorrect. This the Gruen transfer. Do you have any idea what kind of show that would be? It sounds like a food show. The Gruen transfer. I know it's even had spinoffs, like two or three spinoffs, and he hosts all of those. I I would have no idea it's a what cooking this show. show is. It's got to be. What is it? Uh, it's a show. Again, it's a bit hard to explain. But uh, have you seen uh, John Oliver's show? John, uh, John Oliver. Oliver. Do you, have you ever seen that on Sunday night on oh, HBO? Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. John Oliver yes, last yes, week tonight? Yes. It's a little bit like that. It, we look at the world through the prism of advertising and marketing, but to like, yeah, because everything's spin these days, right? Yeah. So it's called the Gruen transfer because there's actually this psychological phenomena where if you've ever gone shopping, you know, like shopping malls are designed to be confusing. They're like casinos. They're all the same temperature. There's no clocks. They want you to... And so there's basically a thing in your brain where you go out to buy like diapers and milk or whatever, and you come home with like a flat screen television (laughs) like your breathing slows your eyes glaze over it's an actual so this has been studied and this is whoever i'm guessing gruen or whoever is the person who studied so they call it the gruen transfer because victor gruen was the guy who invented shopping malls so it's named Ah, after the guy who came up with the design and the way that they're put together he actually hates it but that psychological phenomenon is called the gruen transfer and so because the show is kind of about why we buy what we buy like you know trying to look through the world through the eyes of marketing or whatever so we might take like Kim Kardashian and spend 12 minutes explaining where did she come from? How does she make <laughs> her money? Why does it work? Yeah. Like, but again, like comedically, but like, you know, trying to be kind of smart and interesting with so it. So you've done all of these shows and, and in Australia, you probably then are like a super celebrity. I mean, you walk down the street, everyone knows you in Australia, I bet, don't they? Uh, well, some people probably, yeah. But, but quite a few. A lot, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, when you come here, I'm guessing no one knows you, no right? One. Uh, what's that like? Good. I mean, is it, is it yes. good? Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Like, you know, the amount of times that, like, you know, you're out in public, like, you know, I can just wear my tracksuit pants. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I can just, I can eat that shitty burger at two o'clock in the morning outside that gig, and there's not going to be a picture of it in the paper <laughs> next day, David Hasselhoff style, yeah. you know? So do the, do, do the uh, does the press get involved in your personal life and that kind of stuff, or is it is it different down there? No, 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 definitely. I did a show over here uh, that people can see on the internet called, uh, that Doug Benson hosts called Getting Doug with High, oh, okay. which is like a show 
show where they it's a, it, a internet chat show but everyone smokes pot like that's the you know that so you, you're on the show and because that's not legal in australia that was like front page news oh in wow australia. yeah so like, it's like a big deal that you're smoking weed and uh, right yeah and the, the, the way they reported it in the news over there was like they it obtained this secret footage of me doing it <laughs> i'm like it's on a show people can watch it sarah silverman was on that show the week before you know what i mean like but it was like they were through my window right right, right. yeah so stuff like that scandals you know it is it is weird Dieter. i don't know if you get the same thing but we, we've been here for uh i don't know 11 years uh and have been uh, you know gotten very big syndicated and it's it's like if you're in, if if i'm in a city that we're on especially here everyone knows you you go out you go to a restaurant everyone you walk down the street grocery store whatever everyone knows you but uh, it, it's sort of like when he leaves australia I can just go 150 miles some way to a city where we're not on. Not one person knows you. They right. pay absolutely no atten attention. And uh, it's it's actually almost, it, it takes, it, it, it's it's strange. It's an, almost an odd amount of adjustment. Do you get that, Dieter? Sometimes. But you I mean, probably don't travel as much as I do. Yeah, I travel yeah. a lot. So, right. uh it's a weird adjustment, and and it's I've never been into. I, I I don't mind people coming up to me all the time. Um, in fact, it's it's probably a good thing if they, the, when they stop coming up to you, you know that the show sucks. It's time to find a different career. Um, but then when no one knows who you are, you you start to question. Wow, am I? Uh, do I uh, am, am I addicted to this uh, fame almost or something? Have you experienced anything like that? I it, it, here's the thing about being a stand up comedian. I reckon is that you know because it's like a joke by joke job application. Like every night you can die. Yeah. Like there's no you know no one cares when you're on stage in front of an audience how many awards you've won or how many years you've been doing your radio show or like you know whatever you've been. No one cares. You're like you've just got to be funny next and yeah. you've got to be funny next and they're like ha ha next ha ha right. next right. So I always thought that's. The like, you know, it's very hard to have a big ego when, like, you know, you go straight from your big show to play, like, a taco stand, like, you know, <laughs> like somewhere above a Chinese restaurant where they're like, oh, you had a good set tonight. Here's some wontons. So is one of your goals, so you, you've had these huge shows over there in uh, in Australia because it's the these Gruen shows or whatever, the, the, uh, that that's very was very successful uh, is, my, is my understanding, yep. whatever. Is one of your goals to make it big here in the United States? Because more people, more money, of course, everything that goes with that. Is that something that you're aiming for? Uh, no, I've come over here to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like to ruin my life. That's, that's why I've come here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess so. Like, I mean, for me, it was more about, like, because I loved American stand-up. I really wanted to come over and, like, do stand-up in America. And to be honest, I was, I was saying to a friend of mine the other day, I've had... 16 weeks on the road in the state so you know see, like come to a town for a week do like you know five to seven shows and i've done 16 different places this year i've got to see heaps of america that i never would have got to right, see before right. in some ways what i'm doing now is kind of enough yeah like if other stuff happens as well great but i'm really enjoying like just being able to go out and like just do my show every night yeah. and i kind of be on stage for an hour in front of a new audience and but i'm guessing you would love to get like that like that john oliver guy uh you know he has a show on hbo that's of course that would be fantastic or to get like uh be a correspondent on the daily show or something like that that sounds like that would be right up your alley right yeah i really would like that can you arrange that <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've uh, I, you've identified what I want in the so, same way as I have. So, uh, uh, in a sense, are you frustrated because I'll bet when you come over here, you have an agent, I'm guessing. Uh -huh. But when you go into things, if you want to audition or you want to have them set up a meeting or whatever, you've done all the successful stuff in Australia, and then you sit down with someone here and they go, "I don't know who this guy is." Or uh, I mean, it's almost like starting from square one again. Yeah, but I, I, I like that. You do? Yeah, I really do. Like, I mean, that's the thing that I've always loved about stand-up is, like, I always think the best gigs you ever do are the ones that, like, when they start with no idea who you are and by the end they think you're fantastic. Yeah. Like, because in some ways it's the expectation gap that makes things funny, right? Like, if someone says to you, this is the funniest joke in the world, it's never going to be the funniest joke right, in the world right. because you've raised the expectations too high. Right. Like, the funniest one is where you don't expect it and it's really funny, right? Right, right. So I, I think, like, about coming over here is, like, I know... Like, like what I can do and I know there's heaps of stuff that I'd like to get better at as well but 
like I kind of feel like, well, they'll, you know, if I get an opportunity to do stuff, people will enjoy it. So no, I like the challenge. I reckon it's cool. In fact, I, I, in fact, it invigorates me. Yeah. I think it's much better than. I think comedy's hard to do when you're too successful and too comfortable, right? Like nobody wants to hear my butler tells me that crisps are expensive, you know? Yeah. Hey, are you guys having a hard time getting a good pool guy? Like, no one wants to hear that crap, right? Well, do you uh, – so that brings me to my next question. When you have all of these successful shows in Australia, and they, they do very well, uh, and you have a lot of success and you're, you're, you're hosting all these different shows and whatnot – how, what is the financial reward? I mean, is it is it quite high? I would think so. That you get paid very well to do that. There's, you know, they they you you obviously must be good at what you're doing, or they wouldn't keep putting you on these shows. So there's a demand for you. Are you making big bucks over there in Australia? Well, like, not like big time American bucks, but like I, I make enough money that I can come here and do this. <laughs> are you a millionaire? Would you Would you say? Well, what is it? What is a millionaire? Well, are you worth a million dollars? Yeah, I mean, yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. Really? Wow. See, that's that's fantastic. So you still? I mean, you're making big bucks. Uh, but you'd make probably if you could do the same thing that you're doing in Australia. If you could, if I mean, host a show, you'd probably right. make what twenty times more or something. Right. I'm guessing. Absolutely. Probably. Yeah. 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 Uh, Will Anderson is here with us. He'll be at Hilarities uh, this weekend. Uh, let me take a quick break. We'll be right back on Rover's Morning Glory. Hang on. Rover's Morning Glory.